nobody can excel in life constantly, correctly to the end of their life without operating on their hopeful levels. Service to God is the advantage for the disadvantage. Fact. I ask that the Holy Spirit will help us tonight in Jesus' name. Today, we'll be talking about a very important topic, talking about your blood be upon your heads. Your blood be upon your heads. The manual is a little bit too voluminous because I told Pastor to help me do the edition and post, but he put everything, he downloaded everything without taking his time, but I still appreciate him. <laughs> and the golden verse is Acts 18, verse 6. The scriptures say, But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Can someone who, who said this? Who made the statement in the scripture? Paul. And we'll be looking, media, if you can help me with uh, Acts chapter 18. We will go through the scripture together. We will talk together. And we'll trust the Holy Spirit to enlighten us together. Let's look at Acts chapter 18. If the media is there, let's project and read together as we apply the manual with the study. So verse 1 says, please look at your scripture and also focus. The Holy Spirit will put your mind here. He say, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. So like we all know, Paul is a missionary. We know his story from the beginning till now. So he was coming from, I don't know if it's Athens or Athens. But he was coming from Athens and now he's in Corinth. That is where he is now. And this is chapter 18 of the book of Acts. And the introduction said, a continuation of Paul's missionary journey. This is the beginning of his second missionary journey. He did the first, he did the second, and he's going to end it on the third missionary journey. And this time, there was a call for him and Barnabas. You know, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work I have for them. There was a call. There was a lot of stuff that happened in between. They were divided. They separated. Paul went with Silas. Barnabas went with some other person. But at the cost of all these things, it was as if, oh, why will Paul and Barnabas separate? But the Bible does understand that even in God's divine plan, it was meant to be. Because it was like God having two missionary representative in different parts of the cities. There was a time when they all scattered. There was a lot of stuff that went through from the beginning of Acts, the first missionary until now. And in the second missionary journey, we're told that Paul looked at around and just felt within himself that, okay, it is time to just reflect. It is time to go back and do follow-up. It's time to go back and do like a revisiting. It's time to go back and look at the churches and the peoples we have established and let's see how they are doing. So that was the next, th that was the next plan. You know, it was, very, it was a strategic missionary. And then we continue from the reading. That is just the introduction for us to be on the same page. And now he's in Corinth. Let's look at verse 2. Media. And then while he was in Corinth, the Bible says he found a certain Jew named Aquilia. You know, Aquilia and Priscilla. This was where Elder Lawa shared with us last week. And he did a very good job sharing this. And we all know that Aquilia and Priscilla are couples. And they are well known for their tent making. They are so good with tent making. And funny enough, even Paul was a tent maker. This was his job. This was what he does for a living. But even though he does that, there's something he loves to do more, which is preaching and sharing the word of God all around the city. And now in verse 3, he's right now in Corinth. He found these couples and he was able to relate with them, interact with them. So because he was of the same trade, you know, he stayed with them and they were all enjoying their stay together. Verse 4. Media help us quickly. And he reasons in the synagogue every Sabbath, which is all, always his, 
his, his way of life. Anywhere he goes, he either finds a place to build a church or he goes and found the location where the, 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 the temple or the synagogue, whatever they call it then is, and he stays there and he tries to gather all the Jews, even the Greeks, and say, okay, let me share the word of God, let me persuade you. Verse 5, verse 5, which is our main focus, that is where we're going. And when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, remember I said Paul and Silas, they were together, but they had to separate. And Silas had to come back again with Timothy because he was in Corinth. They said, oh, let's go visit brother Paul in Corinth. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, they were in other parts doing the work. And Paul, the Bible says, was compelled by the Spirit. Some people feel Paul compelled by the Spirit also means that he was pressed by the Spirit to Go ahead and continue the work. And other people felt, oh, to be compelled by the Spirit means he was so excited that the, the, work, the work of God was just his excitement, that he just continued, even though his friend had to come check on him. And then we want to talk about Corinth from here. In your manual, it talks about Corinth. The reason why I'm making emphasis on this is because Corinth is very, very significant. The, 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 the story about Corinth made us to understand that this is one of the most influential cities in the Rome world. The Bible made us understand, and also history says it's one of the commercial cities of trade, of travels. You know, it reflects loose, loose morals, materialistic outlook, booming economy, wickedness, prosperity, sinful nature, cosmopolitan nature, immorality. And when you think of this, what comes to mind when you think of Nigeria? What, what, what comes to mind? Eh? No, let's go to Nigeria. <laughs> There's no Nigeria. Las Vegas, you know, somewhere that is bubbling, somewhere that is full of life, you know. This is where Paul fell. Oh, I need to go to this place. I feel this place is kind of a very central place. And people all over the place, because of the trades and all the commerce, people and the travels. You know, Florida, think of all those big places. People from all over pass through. And therefore, if I plant a church here, definitely people can be transformed, people can be changed. That was the idea behind him going to Corinth. You know, and it also presents to us the kind of personality, individual Paul is. He's not just an ordinary Christian. He was a Christian with a mission. And it's also a call to us as believers, a Christian with a mission. The Bible made us understand that Paul... Never look at easy things. Sometimes it goes far into difficult places. The manual says a tough city. Paul never looked for easy places. He never looked for just gathering church and just staying there till Jesus come. He wants to explore. He wants to go into the deep. He wants to go deeper, you know. And he kept pressing on. He kept pressing on. He was not looking at the location. He was not looking at, oh, this place looks so rough. This place looks so rugged. And it's also a, a thing for us to consider as believers. We have been talking about this book of Acts in a long while. And we have also asked questions. I remember Pastor Lale coming here and saying, what if they, if they transfer you to this place? Are you sure you really want to take the mission there? Are you, want, are you going to represent God there? But often time we all joke about these things. We laugh about it. But if people like Paul does not exist, who are the people that we make God proud indeed? You know, there are many places that we, you know, we are, we are fortunate in America. Those days in, in Africa where I came from, they would just transfer pastors to places. The pastor cannot stay for in, a, in a church for years. They would transfer you without your apology or your permission to this place. The work must continue. And even as believers, wherever you are in your workplace, are you looking at the comforts? Are you looking at the places and say, oh, do I really want to serve here? Do I really want to talk about Jesus here? Do I really want to take the, the walk far? So Paul was that man that will do anything even to make sure that the gospel, the word of God is spread abroad. Is spread abroad. He, has, he has given his life to that mission. And it's also something for us to ponder about that Looking at this uh, manual and looking at the life of Paul, I also reflected. I'm like, does that mean because uh, the people that were in that place were also Jew? They were Jew. And these Jews, they know some, they have knowledge about Jesus, but they just don't want to accept him. As his, you know, they don't want to accept him, even though they live in that location. So Paul did not just go for Corinth people. He went and he was able to target the Jews. He was able to look for them and say, you have a knowledge of the word. And I want to persuade you to accept, to receive this word and to live as a believing Jew. So that was one of the 
the goal of Paul even while he was there. And the question there is how far, even as believers, can you go for the Lord? How far, as a child of God, can you go for the Lord? I want the media to look at 1 Corinthians 24 to 27. 1 Corinthians 24 to 27. Paul was a man of passion, and he was also a man that was obedient to the Lord. The Bible says, For but those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, keep, keep, keep projecting, please, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Continue. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Continue. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Paul was not considering his capability or his ability, even while he does the work. He was so passionate about the work, and he was going to do anything to make sure he gets the, the he pleases the Lord and he gets the work done. So looking at his passion, sometimes we might think, oh, our career could be a passion, you know. Our tent is, is for him, his tent making was his was his occupation. But I don't want to believe that was his passion. The the Bible made us understand from different scripture that Paul was passionate about the work. From the manual, it says he loved the ministry work. He has a strong passion for preaching the gospel. He was vibrant in reaching for lost souls, you know. And the definition of passion, like we all know, is a strong love, a desire and affection for something. And the question comes that how passionate are we, even as believers, still for the things of God? Sometimes we just say, oh, I love God. But how, how loving do you really love God? How passionate are you about his work? How passionate are you about his businesses? A passion is a strong love, a desire, and an affection for something. And just like we said earlier, Paul will go extra mile for God. He will go extra mile in obedience. He will go extra mile in sacrifice. And he will go extra mile in pleasing him in all things. In fact, from that scripture in Philippians 1 verse 21, it said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Is that our confession? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. When we weigh the, the, the act, when we weigh our minds, even as we are seated, uh, are we bold to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? In Acts 21 verse 13, they all, a paraphrase, he said, I'm ready to die for the sake of the Lord. You know, sometimes I hear Christian and say, oh, that was Paul. That was the capacity that Paul has. That was the grace he has. But let's be real. How passionate are we still for the things of God? Paul was not considering a, a place of comfort. Corinth was, not, Corinth was nice. It was beautiful. It was okay. But he was not just looking at the comfort of that place. In the midst of the comfort, he stood out to do the work. In the midst of the comfort, he stood out to say, I will please my master. In the midst of the comfort, are we still standing out? In the midst of the comfort, do we still remember that there is someone that, that positioned us where we are and is still giving us the capacity and the privilege to utilize that opportunity to be a blessing to souls? Am I making sense? Paul has passion and his passion was the passion for the things of God. I remember the story of Nikki Adeyemi as we continue because we are going to the main core of today's teaching. We want to consider the opposition and the blasphemy that Paul faced. And we'll talk as a church on how do we handle opposition even while we give ourselves away for the things of God. How do we handle blasphemy even while we give ourselves away for the things of God. I remember uh, this pastor Nikki Adeyemi some time ago. I can't really place the the story, but I knew I had the story through one of her messages. She was talking about while the church was still growing, the Lord inspired her to go into the brothel, I believe it's the brothel where the Lord stays, and she decided to take that as a ministry and keep going there to minister to those girls. You know, she was able to win one or two to God, and they were able to come and testify. And, and 
through that souls, many souls were embedded. So oftentimes when we are doing the work of God, when we give ourselves away to God, we just feel like, oh, we are just doing it. And we forget to, 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 to the scripture that says God is a rewarder. He's a rewarder. Regardless of, of how you feel, why you are even going through those assignments, the, the, the goal, the goal of, of heaven is that you just at least follow up with one soul. One soul can bet millions tomorrow. One soul can bet nations tomorrow. So the place of being persistent and keep going, regardless of how we feel, is very, very important. Paul was a man of passion. And I also see that in many lives, many men of God, many women of God. I, was, I also stumbled onto one of Pastor Funke's messages some time ago. She was sharing about before she got married to her husband, she had this, um, they had this evangelism team that they go, like a mission trip that they go to where they, they go on a river or in a boot to share the word of God. And she said that was like a month to her wedding. And while they were going, they had the, the team that when they had a shipwreck. They had a shipwreck and I think about three died in that shipwreck. So she was not the pastor, neither her husband, but they came back home and they were sharing and encouraging the brethren and the pastors about the loss of the three souls. And after their wedding, there was a call again to go back to that same village for another, <laughs> for another evangelism. Then they were married. Are we getting the story? Are we going to go? How many of us will go, Sister Atari? <laughs> you won't go. Why? <laughs> Pastor Kemi, will you encourage your husband to go? <laughs> Pastor Lola. So the woman was so humble and sincere. She said, please, my sweetheart, you cannot go this time. It is not possible to go. You cannot go. But to the glory of God, the man agreed to go. He said, you can sit at home, I will go. You know, that song that's, that just comes to mind, we go to the Lord, we, to any land, no matter the struggle, I must go, I must go. What is our excuses when God calls? What is our excuses when there is an assignment to be done for the maker? And the, Bible, and the story says the husband went. He went for this program. And he came back to the glory of God. And while she was preaching, this was a passion for her husband. This was a passion and he keep going and going every year. She was ministering that day and she said, Pastor is not here because he had to go to that city to win more souls. And that soul has been, that, that village has been saved, it's been revived, and Jesus has been enthroned in that place. God is looking for people like Paul. God is trusting us to rise and take our place regardless of how comfortable we are, even in America. Now let's continue with our reading in the book of Acts chapter 18. I think we stop at verse 4. We want to look at the opposition. Because Paul went through a lot of opposition as well. He, has all, all, he always lived his life in opposition. All through his first missionary, it was opposition. Second, even till he died. But this man stood his ground and said, whatever it is, I will stand for the Lord. Let's look at um, Acts chapter 18 where we stop. Verse 5, I think verse 6, verse 6, we're in verse 6, Andrew. We're in verse 6. We are reading from Acts chapter 18, from verse 1 through 18. For as many that are just joining us. All right. But when they opposed him, let's not forget, he's in Corinth at this time. Silas and Timothy were there to encourage him because they know, oh, this guy is in a very interesting place. Let's go and support him. And they were there with him. Aquila and Priscilla were there with him. He has a lot of support system. And Paul was a guy that loved teamwork. He liked to work with people. In verse 6, the Bible says, And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, Paul did something. The Bible says, He shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth, and I will go unto the Gentiles. That was his response. And here is where we're going to talk. But before we want to talk, we're going to talk, I want to ask us, before we go ahead, the difference, when you, when you think of opposition and blasphemy, what are the difference between the stamps? Opposi opposition and blasphemy. Busayo, please pass, pass the mic around. What comes to mind? Thank you. Brogbenga. Are you okay? 
opposition and blasphemy, what comes to mind? Anybody? The difference between oppose, oppose and blaspheme. What that was the difference? Difference between to oppose and to blaspheme. Praise the Lord. Um, first, I want to say that I can oppose something without necessarily blaspheming. Opposition in the street is a situation where I'm saying what you are saying now. Don't say it. But when I want to blaspheme, I means uh, I want to say that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. There are two different things. Or the Holy Spirit is nothing like the Holy Spirit. There's nobody like the Holy Spirit. That is blasphemy. So if I oppose you based on principle, it's not does not necessarily mean that I blaspheme. So that's just it. Blasphemy, you cannot blaspheme against you can blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. I can oppose you based on what you are saying. I know you are not saying the thing the way I wanted it to be said. So those are there are two different levels. I just want to clear that out. If somebody wants to take it further, uh, our lawyer can. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Uh, um, Elder Lamala has made the distinction, but I just want to share a little bit of light. Uh, blaspheming is you don't you blaspheme against God, against the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So when when Paul is talking, what Paul is talking about here is like you are blaspheming against God, because everything they say it's it's uh, they believe in the Torah. And they believe that, oh, their God is different from the God of, uh, what is it called, uh, Paul that he's talking about. So they're blaspheming against God. But opposition is to your person. You oppose that person. You are opposing him from moving forward. You are opposing him from carrying out his activity. You are injuring him from moving forward. So there are two different things, like he said. So if you are opposing someone, you are not opposing God. You are opposing that person from carrying out what God says. But when you blaspheme, you are going a little bit, uh, a little bit further to talk about what that person is doing and what who is God, and you are now uh, saying wrong things that are not true, saying things that are false against God. That's so correct. I believe we are all on the same page now. To oppose and to blast. It was it reacted from that um, from that scripture. We can all see. So now. Just like you said, to oppose is to, they were opposing him. And blasphemy, they were blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Probably they were blaspheming against Jesus. They refused what he said. Like from my, from in, in, in acceptance to what we said, I said a great, a great disrespect to a supreme being or to God, to the holy, holy, holy being. And it's kind of profane, very offensive. It's like an attack. Like disregarding God, disregarding his person. And that kind of made Paul a little bit uncomfortable. And that is why we saw in verse 7, the Bible says, and he departed from there. So from your manual and from my manual, why do you think Paul took an action? What action did he take and why did he take such action? What would make him just like, my question says, did he, was he angry? From the, man, from, the, from the scripture. Was he really angry? Do we know if he was angry? From that uh, verse we read. Because the Bible says he departed from there and he entered into a house of a certain man named Justus. Was Paul really comfortable with everything? Anybody? He was not, right? <laughs> are we murmuring or we are contributing? <laughs> Praise the Lord. He was, well, I wouldn't say he was angry. Um, it's not recorded, so let me not be categorical about it. <laughs> because we know we say something about holy anger. So um, I don't, but he's acting in line with the instruction of Jesus in Matthew 10, um, 14. Matthew 10, 14, where he said, And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, 
when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust off from off your feet. So more or less, it's just in line with this uh, instruction. Since they've opposed, since the, especially even for Christians, when they are turning into blaspheme, it's something that we may need to just excuse ourselves at that point. Otherwise, we will be drawn into it and becoming like them. So the moment you tell them the word of God and they, they, they oppose, they begin to tend to blasphemy, just gently excuse, excuse them. yourself and leave them. The blood is upon their heads. Exactly. So when we hear of the word also, the blood is upon... The blood is upon your head. Your blood is upon your head. I believe that he said it out of frustration. He has said everything to convince them mm -hmm. of the kind of life they were living. And they will still continue to oppose him and to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the best he could do at that time was to wear, I have washed my hands clean. Beautiful. Of whatever you guys are doing, let your blood be upon you. Thank you so much, sir. And that's the lesson we are talking about here. Our reactions in times of opposition... Our reaction, especially when people blaspheme our God. Because when I hear of the word blaspheme, it also reminds me of like, like you are in a, in a group and someone talks about your parents. And not just talk about your parents, they just accuse your parents. You know the reaction you will feel, like the reaction you will feel from the inside. It's, it's not something you will take pleasant. How much more your God? So I feel that was the reason why he made that statement. And looking at that verse, because that is where we are trying to focus upon, where he made that statement and say, your blood be upon your head. As Christian, it's also a message and it's a lesson to us. That even while we are trying to pass the message across, it's not in our power or in our ability to convict a soul. Even though we are, we are expected to do the, the, the winning of souls, to go after souls. But when it comes to a time when they are struggling you know, to give their life to Jesus or they, you know, uh, there was a, a, a understanding I have. Like, at that point, the Jews could see. They could see the miraculous signs. They could see the wonders that Jesus was doing. And right in front of him, they could blaspheme. Right in front, front of, apost of the apostle, they could blaspheme Jesus. This is what they witnessed, you know. And that was why the frustration that uh, Paul expressed was out of you can all see these things and you can still be bold to blaspheme and talk against God like this. Compared to we, even though it's also important for us as Christians in these times and age to be careful of blasphemy. You know, there are times where some, some Christians, they, they claim that they can't see the miracles. They claim that they can't see the, the signs and wonders. But the Holy Spirit that was given to us is a testament of the many things that Jesus has done. The death and resurrection of Jesus is a testament of what he has done. And for us to just look and say, oh, there's no point. I don't, I don't believe in your God. You know, it's, it's, it's very painful to, even, to, even to God. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a peril to such individuals. So I want to focus again on the place of blasphemy. How do we undo blasphemy when we are in the midst of People that used to be believers. How do we undo blasphemy while we try to win people to Christ? So that was the frustration that Paul expressed when, the, when he was trying to convince them and they seemed not to understand. When you look at Matthew 7 verse 6, the scripture gave us light there. It said when people are determined to reject the gospel, we shouldn't keep trying we shouldn't go back and start trying again until there's an access, there's an opening. Because oftentimes when people block their minds to the gospel, it's not in our place to keep convincing them. Our assignment in times like that is to go back and pray that the Holy Spirit himself will convict them. And while Paul has done his part, he felt within himself that, oh, I am clean. And that statement definitely was just, I have done my part and I'm clean from the blood of this soul. I'm clean from the blood of the soul. Like a faithful watchman, I have given the words. I have delivered the, the words. So it's up to you to believe it or not. That was too much for him to bear. That was too much for him to bear. Yes. I'm thinking it could also be a custom back then in the country 
because the same thing happened when Jesus was to be condemned by um, the, I don't know, those guys, in the Romans back then. I think Pilate had to wash his hands and said, whatever you want to do with him, do, do it. And wash his hands. It could be a custom. Pastor Basu quoted that scripture. It is, actually. And even when you look at the Old Testament in the book of Ezekiel, that was where we quoted earlier from our main test. Ezekiel 3, I think from verse 18, if they can post it on the, you know, the scripture made us to understand that even as believers, we are watchmen. Ezekiel chapter, chapter 3, verse 17 through to 21. And he gave us um, examples. Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning for me. Continue. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your end. So what that scripture is saying is that if, you, if God has placed it upon your hands to go and touch, talk to someone or to win soul or to do this assignment and you decide within your end like, oh, I'm not going to do it or you just despise and, you know, the blood will be on your end. Yet if you want the wicked and then he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. You have delivered your soul. So it's applicable here in the case of Paul. But I still want to believe he was kind of frustrated. Number one, he was a Jew. Number two, he knew these people should know better. Like they know, but they are denying the truth. Therefore, if there's nobody contributing, I want us to go to how to react to blasphemy. I I want to praise God. uh, We have to know the premises at which this, what we consider as probably frustration or thing comes up. Paul was meeting with from that phase five, it was stated that the Holy Spirit moved him. That was like a compelling, that's a, um, you have been moving your spirit to do this. And he went to the temple and he met them. The people he was discussing with at that time, they are not, uh, they are not novice. They are people that know, but decide, they decided to do what they are doing uh, in attempt to like, we are going to oppose you. And they went for that to, or to blaspheme against God, denying Christ. And when you, we have to know where to draw the line as a child of God. Uh, this is very, very important. That some people have made up their mind. When people have gotten to the point where they don't care about eternity, they don't care about the personality of God, about Christ, and they start speaking against Christ, against the Holy Spirit. They are signing up for trouble. Uh, it, it, the people that killed Jesus, if you see an example, when they said Matthew 27, verse 25, they were so careless that they brought causes upon themselves. They said, let his blood be upon us and be upon our children. When people have gotten to that point, you don't want to argue with them. Just move away from them. If you have a friend who doesn't care about how they... They, they said... And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and be on us. The children that are yet unborn, they're already putting the curses on them. Now, we see that example also when you read Acts chapter 20, verse 26. Paul said, Your own blood be, he said, I am free from everybody's home blood. That's when you have declared the mind of God over a situation to people and they insist on that is what they are do- going to do. As far as God is concerned, you are free from that blood will not be required of you. It also tells us that as a child of God, we are responsible to preach to un- unsafe people around us. We are responsible to warn people when they are backsliding. We are responsible to warn people about the step they are taking that is against God. But if they feel they said they don't care, then you have justified yourself. So it's a serious thing that Paul was saying here. He was able to say, I have done my home part. When they opposed him, it was okay. But when they come to a point of blasphemy, brethren, at that point, he's a willing denier of the assistance of God, of Christ. At that point, you have, there's nothing you can do. The best you can do for such fellow 
is to pray for them. So but we have to know when to draw a line as a child of God and when, not to, uh, when you can keep pressing. When it has come to a point that I don't care about the blood, <laughs> you should know that uh, uh, this has passed your own, uh, uh, your own period. Amen. Thank you so much, sir. So basically, it's up to us as believers when we are called and we are, you know, I love that word the pastor used. He said, when you are compelled within your spirit, it's, it's the Holy Spirit prompting you to do something. You must be intentional about doing it, especially when it comes to souls. You know, we must have a burden for souls to the extent that when we have a pressing in our heart, we must not just give up on them. From that scripture, I think it's scary enough for me to just say, oh, I will ignore people. I will just do it when I feel like. So when we have a pressing need in our heart, like speak to this person, and especially to the backsliders, those that have given up on Jesus. Those, they've, they've known God before, but they've, they've turned back. It's a burden upon us as believers to reach out to them, to make sure that they are still standing. And even if, you have, if, if after you have tried and it looks like they are not compliant, then it's up to them. Because there are people that you see that are hurting. And by reason of that, or they have made up my mind, their mind that no matter what anyone say, this is their stand and this is what they want to stand with. And it's, it, it, when, people, when you talk to someone and, they, are, and they, are, they, are, they know the truth, but they don't want to accept it, it's like they are rejecting the truth. They are rejecting the person of Jesus. And that can also be called, called blasphemy. You are blaspheming. When you, when you know the truth, but you do not want to accept it as the truth, you are rejecting the truth. It's kind of blaspheming the master. So let's, let's know that this is one of the sins that is very, very unpardonable from our manual. Um, I'll quickly read that because of time. Jesus said in Luke 12 verse 10 that everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, you speak against Jesus, will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes is in scripture, is quoted in Mark 3, 23 to 30, is quoted in Luke 12, verse 10. Even in our present generation, we might say, oh, those people, they saw and they did not believe. But Jesus already paid the price, and the Holy Spirit is a testament of the truth. And then for people to now say, oh, they know the truth, and they don't want to accept it, they are blaspheming. But when we people blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is a sin that can never, never, never be forgiven. And it's so sad because even it means that in internal, eternity, it is not forgiven. It's an unpardonable sin. You know, I don't know if we still have time, we'll, we'll have definitely read, read those other scriptures because the story about, um, about, um, I can't even remember at this point. But I know it's a story where they were, they were, speaking, they were calling Jesus uh, Bal, Bal Zebal. They were calling him devil. You know, they were calling him a name. He was, sharing, he was trying to reach them and they were calling him a name that, oh, the things you do, you do it in the name of, this, uh, of the devil. Basically, it's devil. You do it in the name of the devil. They were trying to tarnish, tarnish, you know, tarnish his image. And that didn't really go well. It was, it was not a forgivable sin. They did something that is internal. There's no remedy for absolute denial of the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's why in that scripture, I wish we can read, Matthew 12, 25 to 36, Jesus discussed blasphemy as intentional against Jesus, which is forgivable, but against the Holy Spirit, non-forgivable. You know, because um, God is a gracious God. I don't want to read that. And these people that we're talking about are not ignorant. They are not unbelievers. But intentionally, they are doing the evil things they are doing out of rebellion to God. Some people are hurt. Some people are in pain. Some people, they are bringing the, 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 the hurt of their family background into their work with God. And whatever we say to them doesn't make sense. You can reject the truth of the gospel and repent later. But to willingly reject the work of the Holy Spirit is at one peril. There's no forgiveness for it. I pray that the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. We will not walk against the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. But even while we are talking about this, there's a very strong burden for a need to pray. You know, we should not be selfish in our prayer to intercede for those that are lost, for those that have known the Lord before. 
But due to circumstances, there's nothing that you say that makes sense to them. We have people like that. We have family members in our homes that their foundation was Christ. Imagine if I have a brother or a sister where my parents build us up in the Lord. And here I am sharing the word of God and they are doing something else, maybe pro God forbid prostitute or any other thing. It's very painful. And that's why we must put ourselves in that situation where we see people that their foundation were Christ, but somehow they were plucked out and nothing you say to them about the gospel makes sense. And it's also a call for us for our children where you pour and pour into the life of your children and God forbid they come out and they come out to, to become somebody else and the more we try to redirect them to the truth they just don't want to accept the truth that is a very very painful place to be I pray that the Lord will keep us and the truth that we have known will not be taken away from us in the name of Jesus the final manual says in Hebrews 6 verse 4 to 6 if you can project it that would be nice so it talks about impossible task of bringing back a backslider let's see what that scripture says just a summary of what I said now it says for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit verse 5 and I've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the ages to come. Verse 6. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Because what they have done basically is that they've crucified again for themselves the Son of God. And put into an open shame. Verse 7. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears apps for, you know, Let's leave that. So basically what that scripture is saying is that it's very difficult for people who have known the Lord before to fall away. You know, it's like basically what they've received the Savior before, but somehow situation happened which is not permitted. It's not an excuse for them to fall anyway, but it's like they are biting or they are, they are sending Jesus back to the cross again. So for people that in this situation, there's a place for us as believers to begin to intercede for them. Those people are considered as someone who are crucifying the Son of God to their own body all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. May we not be an ex-believer in the name of Jesus. May situation not make us to turn back in the name of Jesus. And this kind of sin, if they are not careful, often leads to spiritual death, often leads to physical death. If they are not, if they are not repentant and if they don't come back to the Lord. I think I'll have to stop here. If there's any contribution, it will be welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Full faith. Uh, so if they fall away from the faith, is it possible for them to lose their faith? So for believers that falls away from the faith, uh, is it possible for them to lose their faith? Uh, in terms of, okay, they backslided, they gave up on God, and now they don't go to church anymore. Have they lost their faith? If they die, will they still go to heaven? I want to believe when they fall from faith, it's because they've lost their faith. <laughs> Are you talking about if they fall out of faith, will they lose the Holy Spirit? Because the question you said is if they fall out of faith, that means they've already lost their faith. Before if they fall faith. out of faith. So that means they're no more in faith. Faith means you have the belief that God, God is. Faith is the belief you have in God. So if you do not believe anymore, that means you are not in faith. You can either be in faith or out of faith. There's no intermediary. That doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean that you are still, maybe you are still not classified as maybe uh, God's son because you've given your life to God. But if you are, if you are a backslider, depending on, to my understanding and to, to what I know about the Bible, depending on how far you've gone in, then you say, oh, you can still be redeemed. What Pastor Mises is talking about is when somebody commits their unpardonable sin. There are some sins that are unpardonable. When you commit your pardonable sin, it is never been forgiven in this age and in the age to come. 
So if you commit an unpardonable sin, you can never be forgiven. And that's when it looks as if you have crucified Jesus again the second time. But let's say you are a liar and you, you've lied and because of your persistent lying, you fall out of faith. And somebody come back to you and preach the gospel to you and bring you back. Yes, that doesn't mean that you cannot come back to faith. You can retrace yourself and come back to faith. That is my own understanding. Praise the Lord. Uh, I hope your question is not trying to suggest that once saved forever saved. I think he's just trying to clarify between backsliding and total loss of faith. Like, if you backslide and you never repented, of course, you lost the faith. Any backslider that never came back to, to repent, the faith is no longer there. The moment you backslide and you didn't have the opportunity the thing to... Is backsliding is in degrees. It's, it's in degrees. degrees, yes. I think maybe one day, maybe the opportunity will come for us to actually look at that scripture of unpardonable sin. Because all it just means, all it, because I, I've had, and it's rooted in this one save forever save. I had that conversation with a friend, and he went and said, look, once you've given your life, you know. And this scripture was what I used in explaining to him. For a child of God, the Spirit of God bears witness in us. So when you hear unpardonable sin, it is not for a child of God. Because for a child of God, you are not going to deny the Holy Spirit. His power testifies in you. You have faith and you believe in him. So when they say unpardonable or sin that cannot be forgiven, it's for those who have denied the Spirit of God outrightly. They've denied, they've refused to accept. Those are the ones that they are saying you can't be forgiven because you heard that gospel, you heard the word, but you have just rejected it. And that's one of the dangers in the blasphemy that we are talking about, that when someone starts tending towards blasphemy, I've, and I've had that experience before, and I'm still praying for grace. God help me. A friend of mine who was unmarried and it was taking long, and I was trying to talk to her, even engage my wife, and she went like, look, it's because you are married. That's why you are able to. So she couldn't handle it anymore. I got to the point, when she came to the point, and I was trying to cite scriptures and give her hope, she told me, look, it's because you believe in the Bible. That is the Bible not written by men. At that point, until today, I just drew the distance. And we were quite close, really, really close back in school, you know. Um, yeah, so when it comes to blasphemy, the person just needs prayer. At that point, there's little you can do. Because the Holy Spirit that should have even convicted them, they've denied that Holy Spirit. They are resisting that Holy Spirit. So It's a very dangerous place to be. from experience you see people that are christians they've prayed as he said your f uh, friend prayed and prayed and their prayers were not answered and they gave up on god and they backslided right uh the person talking to you was once like that mm -hmm. that i totally I, I got out of faith mm -hmm. no pastor could help me mm -hmm. there was no pastor that could really address what i was going through at the time uh, but I believe that the prayers of the saints mm. brought me to tell, if you look at me today, you won't even tell, oh, this guy ever backslided. This guy ever went out of faith, right? So the point of emphasis is when you talk to people and it seems that they have backslided, I keep praying for them. Uh, even the ones that you think are have blasphemed against the name of God. Keep praying for them because uh, you don't know what they have gone through. You don't know what they have seen. Uh, so you don't know the experience they have had as a person. So for me, uh, I can speak from experience. It was God, but it was also the prayers of the saints for those that didn't give up on me, that kept praying for me. And uh, today God was able to restore me back uh, into faith. Amen. I, I think one of the...
question, my question is, what's the punishment for sinning against the Holy Spirit? <laughs> the, the Bible said, Jesus himself told us that he said, this sin, if you sin against, the, against Jesus, you blaspheme against Jesus. He said, you, could be, you will be forgiven if you ask for forgiveness. But Mark chapter 3, verse 29, Mark 3, 29 said, if this sin is against the Holy Spirit, you will not be, what, be forgiven. Why? Because you have to know the nature of the person of the Holy Spirit. Without him, we are not safe. He's the one that brings up. If the Holy Spirit withdrew, I mean, withdraws out of a man's case, your case is finished. If Holy Spirit, <laughs> if Holy Spirit step out of your case in life, you are done. Because what it means is that the person that will actually help you to be saved, that can intercede on your behalf, that can help you, is already out of your, your case. Because you refuse to acknowledge him. It's a very dangerous place to be. Honestly speaking, after going through this for us, I just felt seriously to pray more for people that are backsliding. I, I have serious burden. I'm telling you today that I told my wife, I said, we are not having all the prayer for our own self today. We are going, just going to intercede for people that are backsliding. Because it's a dangerous trend. It's a, it's a path to destruction. Uh, when you see people that are backsliding, there are people you should, be, you should pity most. They are even dangerous than those people that have not known the law before. Because now they are tending towards a path that whereby God will just abandon them. They are almost doomed for destructions. So when you see people like that, there are people to be pitied most. There are people we should pray for most. There are people that are so, it, they deserve more of our prayer than even preaching. Praise God. You don't even. So I feel seriously here, there's a serious warning also for us as believers. That the more you know, at this point of our life, we dare not backslide. We dare not, no God should not allow anything to bring us to a point whereby we start denying the Holy Spirit. No matter what we are going through in our life, let's know that what challenges will come, situation will come, but one thing that you cannot go against is the person of the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God himself. Because through them, every other soul, I mean, trouble of life can be solved. Amen. Yeah, Amen. please, let me, let me add to what Pastor said so that it gives you a little bit of clarity. You see, um, when, like, from the verse that was read, right, we could see an example of the sin against the Holy Spirit. And that is enough, to me, is enough for us to follow. Because what was Jesus Christ telling the, them is, hey, you are telling the Holy Spirit that is not the one that is performing these miracles. So with that... It is a sin that can never be forgiven. So when you make a mockery of the Holy Spirit in what he has done, mm. that he has not, he's not the one that has done it. So when you see men of God performing signs and wonders, and you say, oh, he's not the one, you better, you better you. be careful. Yep. Even though you are a Christian or you are born again, doesn't mean you've not sinned against the Holy Spirit. You need to be careful and just leave it to God. Because it is that scenario that we will be able to depict what, the, what Jesus Christ was talking about, the sin against the Holy Spirit. So if you see someone performing signs and wonders, and you are not sure where he's performing, what is the source of the signs and wonders, it might be, just leave him. Don't comment. Once you comment, you sin against the Holy Spirit in that regard. He said it will not be forgiven, even in this age in and insanity. in the age to come. So when you sin against your flesh... Committing adultery and all that mm -mm. is not, it's your flesh. You can ask for forgiveness. When you sin against, you can, but when you, when you make mockery of the Holy Spirit that is not the one doing these signs and wonders, and he's the one, then. You know, you what, know. what you know. <laughs> no, and and, and uh, another thing is this, we need to be very it's careful. careful because everything we know, but we pretend as if we don't know, but God sees our hearts. Tom, the Lord will help us in Jesus. Let us pray. Let us pray. I believe there's nothing else to say. I believe we've all received the word. And I don't want to think everyone here is perfect, including myself. 
every area where we have failed, let's just begin to ask God for mercy. Every area where we have been careless with our words, every area where we have, we have been careless with our actions, with our thoughts, even with what we say, you know, consciously, unconsciously. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit to just have mercy on us. Let's ask that the Lord will please show us his mercy, his mercy. Every area where we have failed him in our speech, in our action, in our reactions, even where we have, we have done things that we shouldn't, said things that we shouldn't, where we have been so careless as believers. Father, Lord, upon this altar, I cry for your mercy, that you will please show me mercy and show us mercy as a church, as your children, as your sons and daughters. And let's pray for ourselves that, Lord, no situation, no situation will take me away from your presence or make me deny the truth that I have known in the name of Jesus. No situation, no challenge, because the devil is always out there doing own business but on our own part we have known the truth and we must stand by the truth we must we must not get to that point where we say lord i i don't want to hear anything you anymore. Lord, I receive grace tonight. I receive grace tonight that regardless of what may come my way, the truth I have known, oh God, I will not deny truth in the name of Jesus. If you are really burdened tonight, I leave you with the burden, even as you go back to your houses. Let's intercede for those that have vaccinated, those that are going to, through challenging situation. They have trusted God, they are believing God, and it looks like the answers are not coming and they are giving up. Backsliding is in different levels levels, those that are in level one, maybe they're about to, those that are into it already, they are already contemplating if there is a God, and those that are already fully backslidden, saying there is no God, just let me out of this situation, everyone in a situation, oh God, where they are giving up, every of our loved ones, our church members, our family, Lord, we intercede for them tonight, Leka Super Libra Dosha, Holy Spirit, we ask for your help over such in the dwells in the name of Jesus come true for them this season Holy Spirit come true for them this season bring them up bring them out. You are the convictor. Convict them and send your word to them again. Encourage them and strengthen it again in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word that has come forth tonight. Thank you, Lord, because you will strengthen us through this word. You will encourage us through this word and you will help us to take heed that we will not fall even after knowing the truth in the name of Jesus. As we go tonight, I leave you with a burden for souls. I leave you with a burden for souls. In your quiet time, in your personal altar, present souls before God. Present people that you know, that have known the truth but have fought out before God. Our brother says, the prayer of the saints brought me back. Even for Paul, there was a time when he needed prayer. The prayers of the saints brought him out of that prison. I pray that the burden for soul, the Lord will release upon our heart in the name of Jesus. We will not fall out of grace in the name of Jesus. No situation will pull us out in the name of Jesus. Our children that have known this truth will not be plugged out by the influence of negative friends in the name of Jesus. The seed of God in us will work wonders and establish us to the end in the name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen.